All right, everybody. It says I'm live, so welcome to another Monday night where we're going to discuss certain topics related to current events and especially how three different things are pushing us towards martial law right now. And it's something that we need to keep in mind and at least analyze because as time goes on, the likelihood of these events causing martial law scenarios becomes higher and higher. So real quick, just want to say hi to everybody. How do I sound? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Chrissio Nemo says two by four. I'm going to go ahead and take that out. As a compliment. Good to see everybody. We've got Rob Sinelli here. We got Pure Bama Blood. Andrew B is here. Exile Reviews. Thanks for being here. Thank you for modding. Always appreciated as usual. Dave Sickles is here. Jonathan St. Lawrence is also here. And I'm glad all of you are able to make it. So, Oki Khan, hello. Good to see you. We got Jimbo Alago, six by nine. So, everything must be lining up perfectly then. <laughs> all right. So, tonight's discussion, which if you're here on the replay, thanks for joining us and checking in to get the information as well, uh, is about three different things that are pushing us towards martial law here, specifically in the United States. And there is some historical precedent for why some of these things would likely push us in that direction. So we're going to go ahead and talk about things that are happening right now, the things that we should be presuming to cause problems for us here in the near future, and then also talk about some things that have happened in the past where we can see martial law was declared due to some of those circumstances. So hopefully this gives everybody like a good understanding as to why these things are pushing us in that direction. And this is kind of my goal of tonight to share this information while also uh, staying on topic with current events and things that are uh, currently happening. So first and foremost, let's talk about martial law real quick, just to get everybody on the same page. Just a basic overview of what it exactly is. Martial law involves the temporary substitution of military authority for civilian rule and is usually invoked in time of war, rebellion, or natural disaster. Now, the thing to keep in mind as we go through tonight's conversation is that we're mostly going to be taking a look at the war and rebellion clause of that statement, as natural disasters could be catastrophic, of course, in many ways, as we've seen with hurricanes and earthquakes and everything else in our history. Generally, they don't affect the entire country simultaneously. So a lot of what we're going to be focusing on tonight could affect the entire country, not just one area or one localized section of the country. Understand that I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow per se. I do think that these events are pushing us towards an inevitable declaration of martial law of some kind, depending on how things unfold. But I do think that we have time to prepare for it constructively as of right now because there's a lot of things happening uh that we need to take advantage of in the sense of time okay based on the fact that the economy is still not going to easily recover and based on the fact that inflation isn't going away everything you do now is still beneficial for you here in the relatively near future okay so Martial law, that's what we're discussing. What can push us in that direction? Well, first, we're going to talk about a very contentious subject that a lot of people are very passionate about, myself included, but something that could definitely divide the population and create a dangerous scenario where people, let's just say, react in a certain manner, which then pushes the federal government or the local authorities to declare martial law in order to maintain the peace, which is generally what it's purpose is. It's generally used to maintain order during chaotic times where local authorities no longer have the ability to act, where they no longer have the authority that they used to control. So what could cause that possibly? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, Second Amendment related items are a big issue and they're pushing things to a more and more divisive situation, which could eventually lead us to an actual kinetic situation, which is not what anybody should want, but it is something that I can foresee pushing us towards this martial law declaration. And of course, we have historical precedent to let us know why these issues could possibly occur. A new leak shows the ATF will pass rule to eliminate private sales. Now, this is an issue, but this is not the only issue. And we're going to talk about a few more before I show you that historical precedent. So that way, everybody's on the same page as to why this is so divisive and what it is they're actually targeting related to your ability to defend yourself. Understand, not only is the easiest way to declare martial law or to impose any type of authoritarian, tyrannical will against the people uh, to disarm them first, because obviously that makes life a lot easier for those who have to do the imposing. But the other thing to keep in mind is that this can eventually push things to a direction where the declaration would be justified. And I want everyone to kind of remember that throughout tonight's conversation. There is reasons for why people who are in positions of authority would want to declare martial law, would want it to exist, and would want to have justifications for its declaration. So these things could all be part of that equation when it comes to pushing the envelope and pushing the issues forward in order to eventually be able to make that leap. So 
Let's just start here. We'll just take it through. The Biden administration will use executive orders and the weaponized ATF to issue a rule limiting the private sales of firearms. According to the New York Times and verified by Ammoland news sources, the new rule is expected to be unveiled by the end of the year. President Joe Biden plans to announce that he is directing the ATF to close what every town calls the private sales loophole and the digital loophole. The private sales loophole is when an individual sells a firearm for profit but does not possess an FFL or a federal firearm license. So understand... The ATF has been weaponized in many ways against gun owners already. And this is just one more of the clampdowns that they're trying to create that bottleneck effect for people who want to be able to protect themselves and practice their Second Amendment rights. And obviously, people sell and trade firearms on a regular basis on an individual level because it's property that people own. You should be able to sell property. Maybe you buy a handgun. Maybe you decide you don't like it. You sell it so that you can buy a different handgun. That's just how things work. It's what we do with everything. It'd be like saying you can't trade your car to somebody else for their car, even though that's what both of you agreed upon. And that's why this is an egregious over insertion of federal authority into the private lives of American citizens. And this is a big issue. And we're going to see how this is going to compound into more and more of these issues and how eventually, in my opinion, they're, what they're trying to do is poke the bear until there's a reaction and once that reaction occurs a lot of things can be taken away in the sense of civil liberties solely just from declaring martial law but Biden will call on the ATF to develop a new rule requiring anyone who makes any profit by selling firearms to possess an FFL. Guns tend to increase in value over time. A gun purchased in 1980 will likely sell for more money today than its original value. Understand that that's true. So if grandpa has a, a Colt Python from like the 1980s and still has it today, he might have purchased it back then for, I don't know, $300, $400. I don't know how much they ran for back then, but now he can sell that for $2,500. And just because he bought it back then, and now sells it in 2023 and makes a profit, they're trying to say that that's no longer going to be possible for grandpa to do. And that's really ridiculous based on the fact that they're also the reason why inflation is so high and why these things are becoming more expensive every day, which would mean no matter what you do, if you give it enough time, you'll probably end up making a profit because the dollar is becoming worth less and less. But on paper, dollars to dollars, you're always going to make more dollars than what you might have made before. So understand that this is a huge issue issue and this is happening right now this was reported by uh john crump and ammo lands so and this just came out today all right now let's move on and talk about some other pertinent issues related to gun control and what it is they're going to try to do and how this could easily push americans over that edge which is possibly what they want to accomplish and understand that um this is one that takes a lot of patience and understanding in order for people to get through the legislative process and they're very aware of that and what they're hoping for is that people will eventually give up on that process and say look i don't uh, think this is working anymore they're trying to take our stuff they're trying to implement their will upon us so we we need to do something and then in that something that occurs is when they can seize all the power so keep these things in mind as you're being kind of played from both sides as to how you should react to these situations. Because I'm not telling anyone here what they should or shouldn't do or how they should feel or not feel. What I'm saying is that there's always a strategic purpose for why some of these things are occurring, not just because they just want to take your guns. Think about the secondary outcome of what could occur due to that incident, right? Okay. Democrats demand 1,000% excise tax on assault weapons high capacity magazines now this is another move that they're trying to push through now here's something i want everyone to kind of take away from this more so than just the fact that they are trying to eliminate your ability to purchase or own firearms through financial means because a lot of people want to be able to afford this but understand that this is also a direct attack on the population of people who don't have as much income people who are less fortunate in the sense of their financial breathing room and they know that those people are the easiest to control because all you have to do is raise the price to an amount that's no longer affordable and those people will no longer have access to things like firearms and those are the people who generally need it the most because of their circumstances and the situations they live in they live in more dangerous areas they involve themselves with things that require a heightened level of risk just because of where they're located and who's surrounding them so this is something that everyone should look at as an attack on people who are in the in lower income class and it's unfortunate but of course nobody's going to look at it that way from that perspective the people who have this perspective are saying oh we got to save the children we got to save people and this is a dangerous thing that we have to get rid of but in reality they're coming for the poor people first because in general and this is just how life works and i'm sorry if it's true but in general poor people have less resources which means they have less capability of 
fending anything off when it comes to any kind of an attack from a superior force, right? Keep that in mind. Now, of course, you can argue like, well, what about Afghanistan? Understand that there was a lot of funding and and money and uh, military hardware support for the people who are currently in charge over there um, before those conflicts ever existed. And a lot of it was luckily done directly through the CIA. But that's a different story, so let's not get carried away here. More than two dozen House Democrats put forward legislation Friday that would slap assault weapons and high-capacity magazines with a 1,000% excise tax, a change that would raise the price of a $500 weapon to $5,000 in a bid to reduce access to guns across the country. So, your, you know, Bear Stock Glock 19 Gen 3, it's a $5,000 gun now, in case you didn't know right? But here we are. We're trying to, uh, you know, make it reasonable for people to uh, be safer. So only rich people or people with disposable income should be able to hurt other people, apparently, right? So this is why this is so ridiculous. But understand, this is just another wedge that's being pushed in the people uh, in order to make that division and separation. And then in order to create this uh, stigma and this sentiment of, you know, anti-authoritarian concepts. So, uh, this is an issue. Obviously, if this goes through, it would be devastating, and they know it won't go through, but what it does do, because I think a good part of the conversation we need to have with each other here is, if the news exists, what's its purpose? Because at this point in time, we no longer operate under the assumption that media is here to give us the exact bare-bones facts, right? Like, this is not their job any longer, to present us with facts and let us develop our own opinions. So any news story that's put out, regardless of the source, regardless of ideological you know, bending, if you will, when it comes to who's putting it out, regardless of any of that, what's the purpose of these articles? What's the purpose of this story? This has very little, if not zero, chance of getting passed. But the fact that it's being pushed out there, especially in the sense of mainstream news, should remind you that it's probably in order to upset you, and it's probably in order to get that part of the population prepped and ready for whatever it is they're trying to push them to do. So keep those things in mind. This is unlikely to occur, but this is something that they are trying to push through, at least from one political party, and it is specifically targeting people of the lower income class, at least in my opinion. So we have a little bit more of that to go through. Um, let's see here. We've got, uh, I just want to say hi. We got Mike Malone here as well. Uh, we got Bob from accounting, which, uh, yeah, $2,000 yeet cannon. Exactly. Who doesn't want a high point? That's two grand. Uh, Derek Boodle is here as well. And we also have uh, uh, better than nothing. So uh, let's see. Nick also said we didn't know what to do with our extra money in the bank today, so we decided to get our full roof replaced and new chimney flashing. Well, good for you, Nick. And honestly, investing in your your castle per se is never a bad idea, especially because uh, that's probably where you should plan to be during any kind of long term SHDF scenario if that ever comes down to it. Okay, uh, Billy Bird, how much for a lock of that white hair? You get me out of debt, and I will give you white hair uh, for the rest of your life because luckily I can always regrow it. So um, as much as you want, rest of your life, just pay off all my debt. Okay. <laughs> and honestly, I think everyone here should pay off as much debt as humanly possible. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I have debt. I want to pay it off. I've been working on paying it off, but it's something that I have uh, because um, I couldn't afford to buy a home flat out, but I also needed to get somewhere that's more secure and more stable for my family and I. And I decided to purchase a home using a mortgage rather than being able to afford one flat out because otherwise, if I waited for that that time to come, it might not have ever happened. So uh, that's just how it is. And uh, unfortunately, it means I have to work on taking care of that. And that's just being honest. So um, a lot of people out there who preach uh, getting out of debt are also in debt. And it's something that I preach because I know it's a good idea, regardless of the fact of whether or not I'm in debt. Uh, but at least I'm honest about the fact that I am in debt. So we also have, and it's funny how stories keep popping up locally. Uh, I know I live in North Dakota, but uh, things just keep happening here. And I'm like, stop, stop happening here. Things aren't supposed to happen here. Fargo challenges new North Dakota law seeking to keep local ban on home gun sales. So first we have this whole idea that they don't want us to have private sales in general. According to the ATF and the Biden administration, they don't want us to be able to sell uh, firearms to each other on an individual basis. And especially if you're talking about, I don't, I don't know, some kind of post SHTF government tyrannical oversight situation where uh, the average person is just trying to help their local community have access to the equipment they might need and not have. Um, I could see why they might be trying to clamp down on this. So first they want to say no individual sales. Then they want to say no uh, or any any sales through a uh, actual public 
federally licensed gun shop is going to be, you know, a thousand percent tax on it. And now they're saying that, you know, cities like Fargo are trying to get rid of home sales. So Fargo is suing the state of North Dakota over a new law that bans zoning ordinances related to guns and ammunition, continuing a clash over local gun control. The state's biggest city has an ordinance that bans people from selling guns and ammunition out of their homes. The Republican-controlled legislator passed a law this year that limits cities and counties from regulating guns and ammunition. The law, which took effect Tuesday, also voids existing related ordinances. And understand the reason behind that is because the Second Amendment overrides what some city wants to do. And although we see it all over the country on a regular basis, cities trampling all over constitutional rights, um, once in a while, the state wins in court to say, hey, actually, you're wrong on this, and we'll see how this goes. But understand that basically what they're trying to do here is make it harder for people to produce, sell, and distribute firearms and ammunition. So another example of that exact tactic, which is a problem. And now here's the one that I think could cause some real issues. And this is actually going to kind of tie in with some things we're going to talk about later here in this chat tonight. But this is a big one, and this is something you should definitely be watching out for because it's being pushed all over the country, not just in Tennessee. Pro-gun advocates calling on lawmakers to vote no on red flag laws during special session. Okay? Gallatin, Tennessee. Gallatin. I'm not sure how they say it, but you know what? We're going with it. Lawmakers are gearing up to return to the Capitol this month for a special session aimed at addressing gun control in the wake of the tragic Covenant school shooting that took place in March. However, the chances of passing any significant gun reform re legislation, particularly an extreme risk protection order or red flag law, appears slim as the debate intensifies. Legislators adjourn their regular session without making progress on gun reform, leaving advocates for tighter firearm regulations frustrated. Among those pushing for change are Governor Bill Lee and the grieving families of the Covenant community who are calling for the passage of a red flag law to prevent potentially dangerous individuals from assessing firearms or accessing. Sorry. So... Something to keep in mind. First and foremost, we have people in our government that are just going to try to find whatever it is they can find, uh, you know, as a solution to try to placate the people who are overly concerned with some of these issues, right? And I understand wanting to find solutions when it comes to some of these crazy things that are happening in our world. But red flag laws are inherently dangerous. You don't have due process when it comes to them being instituted against you. You are apprehended in some cases, or if anything bare minimum, your property is confiscated and you lose access to your firearms and firearm related items, and you have to go petition the court for why you should get them back and that's not how things are supposed to work in this country and this creates some serious hurdles when it comes to uh avoiding anything related to i don't know like habeas corpus right like we're trying to maintain a civility and a rule of law in this country but these laws literally skirt the court system and don't allow you to present a case and you have no more uh innocence until proven guilty you are now guilty until proven innocent which is completely opposite as to what could happen here. Now understand that red flag laws, uh, I understand why people think they might be a good idea based on the fact that a lot of these people have mental health issues that are committing these atrocities. But the thing we have to keep in mind is that this can be used as a weapon against anybody that somebody doesn't like or disagrees with. And whether or not they can prove that you are guilty doesn't matter anymore. You have to prove you're innocent. And proving that you have no desires or plans to do anything Anything outside of the realm of what the authority might want you to agree to um, is hard to do sometimes, right? How do you do that? Do you have a diary from a year ago where you wrote down specifically that you would never do these things and you're able to provide that evidence in court? Like, how does this work, right? So, and look, there's arguments all over the, the internet and everywhere else about how these things could be prevented. And is there some tie-in based on how we approach mental health these days compared to how it was approached in the old times? Possibly. Are things different in a good way compared to the old times as well yes but are there things that we should consider based on some of these people's patterns and behaviors and the issues we face as a society when it comes to leaving the unstable and untreated uh to their own desires i don't know but what i can say is that these laws are dangerous and this can be used and weaponized against anybody who goes against the grain and this is a big deal and here's the thing pushing the second amendment thing too far will eventually lead to something no matter what, it just will. There's too many people in the 2A community who are just completely unwilling to comply with anything at a certain point, uh, which I totally understand. And uh, yeah, I am part of the 2A community, so you can kind of figure out where I stand on all that. But uh, what I will say is that 
confiscation is where that line is generally drawn, right? We all know that there are ridiculous laws, ridiculous rules. We have ridiculous bureaucracies like the ATF and everybody who's just out of control going to people's doors because of something they ordered on the internet years ago and saying, hey, we saw you ordered this online. How did they see that? How did they know that? They don't have a warrant. Don't we have the Fourth Amendment? I guess not. So with all those things happening, eventually push will come to shove if it continually escalates in the direction it's currently going in. And this is one of those things that could push us towards martial law very easily. Now, here's some uh, historical precedent just to give you some ideas as to things like this that have happened in the past. And obviously we've talked about this before here on this channel, but this is something to remind everybody, okay? Now, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, martial law was not declared. But don't get that confused with the fact that it wasn't enacted in many ways. Louisiana as a state doesn't have a martial law concept within its legalese. So because of that, they couldn't declare martial law because it's just not even in their in their books. But they did declare a state of emergency. They did have the police begin confiscating guns of civilians who stayed behind and were forced to evacuate. And upon being forced to evacuate, their firearms were confiscated. And then we also had the governor at the time telling the police that they were authorized to shoot on site anybody that was creating a dangerous environment or any type of risk. And that is in many ways, what martial law would look like, right? So we have to keep all these things in mind. This stuff has happened before in some form or fashion. New Orleans, September 8th, 2005. Local police officers began confiscating weapons from civilians in preparation for a forced evacuation of the last holdout still living there. Or here, as President Bush sealed the nation for the grisly scenes of recovering the dead that will unfold in coming days. Police officers and federal law enforcement agents scoured the city, carrying assault rifles, seeking residents who have holed up to avoid forcible eviction, as well as those who are still considering evacuating voluntarily to escape the city's putrid waters. Individuals are at risk of dying, said Edwin P. or P. Edwin Compass III, the superintendent of the New Orleans Police. There's nothing more important than the preservation of human life, which, according to him, required confiscation of firearms so these things do occur was that martial law not technically because it was not declared but it could not be declared because louisiana law did not allow for said declaration so keep that in mind um shoot on site was enacted firearms were confiscated and people were forced out of their own property and forced away from their own property so do you think the second amendment could lead to that if confiscation is on the table which i guarantee you 100 percent it is i 100 percent believe so and especially with the rhetoric and the ramping up of the mainstream media to push this concept that people who practice firearms skills and training and are second amendment advocates are dangerous in some way shape or form um those are the people that'll be targeted before any other type of action occurs because they're inherently a danger a risk right so let's see here uh these nuts Good to see you. And you said clown world is getting more stupid, and I agree with you. Uh, let's see here. Nick says, as a light prepper with a Glock 19 and a thousand rounds of federal HST, do I really need a rifle? Yes. <laughs> um, here's the thing: what it comes down to, um, uh, Billy Bird. There's a chat bot. I don't, I don't know of any chat bot going on right now, so I'm not aware of that. And if there is one, it's not something that I necessarily have access to. So. Uh, I apologize if there is one, but I don't know about the chat bot per se. So, um, I don't know. But I will say, uh, yes, Nick, uh, you should get a rifle. A, who knows when you might not be able to access one again, right? Who knows when they'll have a 1,000% tax on them. And ask any local law enforcement or anyone from the military that you might uh, have in your inner circle. But um, it's been proven over and over and over again that handguns are actually not good at doing the job they're intended for. They're just easy to carry on you. Uh, but when it comes to actually needing to do that job, they're very bad at it compared to rifles. Now, can they do the job? Of course. But rifles do the job much, 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 much better. So that's just what it is. Do I think that are, that we'll find ourselves in a situation anytime soon where having a rifle openly out in public is going to be acceptable because of how crazy things have gotten? I don't think so. I think having a handgun is still a better option if you could only have one right now. Uh, but I think that having a rifle is a good idea. And if we ever get to a point where you do need a rifle, you'll definitely want a rifle. I don't know how else to say it. So now just to kind of reiterate, what could deal with some of these gun control issues, at least in the minds of authoritarian tyrants? Martial law. 
because it involves a temporary substitution of military authority for civilian rule and is usually invoked in a time of war, rebellion, or natural disaster. And understand, when martial law is in effect, the military commander of an area or, or country has unlimited authority to make and enforce laws. Martial law is justified when civilian authority has ceased to function, is completely absent, or has become ineffective. Further, martial law suspends all existing laws, as well as civil authority and the ordinary administration of justice. Okay? Now, keep that in mind as we move forward here, because that means your two-way rights don't necessarily matter during a martial law scenario. So if they're trying to go after the guns, and they're trying to get after the population, and they've crossed that line of confiscation, which crossing that line creates that kinetic reaction, which is highly possible in that scenario, that kinetic reaction easily leads to a martial law situation, because suddenly the local authorities and the federal agents and everyone else have their hands full with something that they can't deal with, which is 100% how it would work, because the amount of people who are out there that are willing to stand up for their constitutional rights that are well-armed and well-trained highly outnumber local law enforcement and federal authorities. So the only option for the governor or the president at that time in order to quell said rebellion, which you could easily identify it as if you decided to, would then use martial law to their advantage. That's my opinion. Maybe that's not how it works, but that is my opinion. Now, I do need to mention the biggest supporter of the channel is Midway USA. They obviously make sure that I have access to all the things we were just discussing that some of us would like to not have access to. So, um, or some, some people would like us to not have access to. I want us all to have access to it. I mean, I had to make sure to clarify that one because I think I screwed it up. But thanks to Midway USA for supporting the channel. And honestly, the fact that I sit here and rant about the things that I do and they still support me makes me feel really good about them as a company. So <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think they deserve our support as well. Now, let's talk about another thing that's pushing us towards martial law. Now, this is a contentious one. And this is something that we should be... We shouldn't expect this necessarily but i think there's reason to believe it could happen and i think that we should never want this stuff to happen we don't want these things to happen but eventually and sometimes these things are required and it's outside of our control whether or not that requirement becomes a reality and that's just the honest truth the people in the world right now who are living under strife let's just say people in niger for example um you know and, and, and all over africa really right um they don't really have a choice of what's happening to them right now. It's either do it or don't, right? They have a lot of issues that they have to resolve, and the people who are there don't have a choice of whether or not they're going to be exposed to it. So that can happen here too. To assume that we would never have to go through anything like that is naive and also, um, I guess, you know, in some ways overly confident, okay? So... Uh, let's see. I do want to say hi. We got Luke B here. We got Durgan, Red Scout. We also have uh, Mark Harpin. So plan for the worst and expect it, Mark Harpin says, and I agree. Um, Minuteman69 says, Carcano rifles shoot magic bullets. And that might be true, but I don't have one, so I wouldn't know, I guess. But hey, you know what? Um, you can get them for pretty cheap. I'll, I'll say that much. So I honestly feel like the next election cycle could push us towards something of that scenario but not for the reasons you might assume so that's why we need to discuss these things at detail and also bring in uh historical precedent to understand why this could happen so i don't think that okay first and foremost um martial law doesn't necessarily mean that elections are no longer possible that's not how this works okay um but it does, it is something that those who are in power would benefit from no matter how you want to look at it. And this next election cycle could easily be used as a catalyst for moving things into that direction. And I think that's something we should definitely be keen on and be watching out for based on some of the things that are going on right now, as well as some of the things that have happened in the past. And understanding what we just talked about regarding the Second Amendment and the people who support it and the people who practice and equip themselves and everything else related to it. Um... This is, this is one of the reasons why all of that might come together to create this scenario pushing us towards that martial law declaration, which is something that doesn't generally happen in this country. The last time it was declared was in the 1960s, and look how far we've gotten since then. But you know what? The last time a nuclear weapon was used against another country was in the 1940s. Look how far it's been since then. Maybe we're just due for some of these things, and that's a very unfortunate place for us to be. But unfortunately, it seems like all of our officials is what we're calling them at this point are moving us in that direction so 
where, where, well, how else do you want to do this? Okay. Colonel Douglas McGregor warns the U.S. may may not make it to the 2024 presidential election. If McGregor is right, we could be living in the greatest unforeseen consequence of the 40-year policy of forever war, which has ruined the West. Okay. A very interesting standpoint here. But this is what we want to really talk about here. Okay. All right. Host Patrick Bet David asks whether the disclosure of the recording of Trump is intended to wreck his presidential campaign. In response, McGregor makes his most shocking observation of all, that the next election simply isn't going to happen. Now, I'm bringing this up because that isn't necessarily my thought process. I think the election's going to happen, but I think the election itself could lead us to that situation. And just bear with me as we go through this because there's some weird things that we can kind of connect the dots on that might lead you to similar conclusions as myself, okay? But here's still an important preface from Colonel McGregor that I thought was important to kind of get started with this conversation. Okay. I think things are going to implode in Washington before then. He points to the fragility of the U.S. economy, suggesting a banking crisis so severe that the banks are closed for two or three weeks. I also think that the levels of violence and criminality in our cities are going to spill over. McGregor foresees the vanishing of another form of American isolationism, the belief that crime and disorder will not reach them where they are. People that normally think they can live remote from the problem are now beginning to be touched by the problem, okay? So that was kind of his assertion regarding whether or not the election will even occur. So first off, I agree. I think that economically, we're going to see some even bigger downfalls here in the very near future. Um, I think that we have bitten off more than we can chew. And although we are printing money into oblivion and borrowing money into oblivion, uh, eventually the piper has to get paid from one way or another. And so if we were to look at our, let's just say loan sharks is what we're calling them now. Uh, and how do you deal with a loan shark, right? You have two options. Well, okay, you have three options. You can pay them. You can run away, which as a country is relatively hard to do. Or you can deal with them before they deal with you. Which option do you think we might take? These are things to keep in mind. Now, here's something else that came out uh, in 2021 that I think that uh, is even more relevant today and something that I think you should be aware of, okay? I think that this is a great way for them to implement a martial law scenario against the people, even if they're the ones who are the orchestrators of said coup. Retired General warns the U.S. military could back a coup after the 2024 election. Okay, well, what's one of the things that could enact martial law? Well, rebellion, which a coup would most easily be. As the anniversary of the... Uh, wait, hold on. We're going over here. Da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. This is what I wanted. How could a coup play out in 2024? The real question is, does everybody understand who the duly elected president is? If that is not a clear-cut understanding, that can infect the rank and file or at any level in the U.S. military. And we saw it when 124 retired generals and admirals signed a letter contesting the 2020 election. We're concerned about that, and we're interested in seeing mitigation measures applied to make sure that our military is better prepared for a contested election should that happen in 2024. Does anyone here... And in fact, I'm going to just do a poll on this real quick because I think that we're probably all on the same page. Um, but I have a feeling it's going to be a problem. Okay. Go, YouTube. Let's see. Uh, Billy Bird, you really need to know if I wear boxers or briefs. See, you got it all wrong. I wear boxer briefs. We're, we're preppers here. We like multifunctional things, so I like multifunctional underwear. Okay, so we got Pilgrim Prepper is here. We've got Bob from Accounting. We've got, let's see, Abracadabra is here. You need some jasmine for your rice, and I can appreciate that, um, especially if we're calling you Aladdin tonight. Now, here is an issue. And keep this in mind. Okay. A military coup of the government, especially after an election, a contested election, would be considered an act of rebellion regardless of who is behind the coup, which would then allow for justification for martial law to exist. And under martial law, a lot of things suddenly become a lot easier to accomplish, especially when persecuting your political opponents and when persecuting those who didn't agree with the results that you presented. So... This is highly likely regardless of who pushes it. And this is actually what concerns me a lot. 
I don't think the 2024 election is going to go very well. In all honesty, I think things are going to get even more contentious and more dangerous than they were in 2020. Um, and I think that this could be used as a tool to maintain power for those who want it the most. And a military coup, as many out there that feel that the military has a certain lean towards a certain ideology, this could be a, attempted by either side of the aisle. And in fact, in many ways, it might actually benefit those who are already in power the most because they will be able to use that justification to push martial law and then to push more draconian measures against the people very quickly. How worried is he on a scale of 1 to 10? I see it as a low probability, high impact. I hesitate to put a number on it, but it's an eventuality that we need to prepare for. Not like a, a concept, but in his opinion, an eventuality. In the military, we do a lot of war gaming to ferret out what might happen. You may have heard of the transition integrity project that occurred about six months before the last election. We played four scenarios, and what we did not play is a U.S. military compromised. Not to the degree that the United States is compromised today, as far as 39% of the Republican Party refusing to accept President Biden as president, but a compromise nonetheless. So we advocate that the particular scenario needs to be addressed in a future war game held well in advance of 2024. Okay? So, oh, uh, yeah, what... We'll move on past that because we got a lot to cover still. This is an issue. A military coup is highly likely in the sense of a contested election. It could try to secure the results for the winning party. It could try to implement results that it felt were more reasonable based on a uh, an outside party. Um, and it could also just take control based on the fact that the electorate body has lost any of its authority and ability to rule or govern so there's a lot of things that could be happening here and understand always look at it from the perspective of who benefits the most from this and in my opinion as preppers and as people who want to live as free americans regular people do not benefit from martial law being declared and if there was indeed a military coup of the government martial law would be declared regardless of who is considered in charge at the point and whoever's in charge is going to declare it and use it to their advantage to do what they need to do with it it's a bad scenario no matter how you look at it. The other thing to keep in mind is that governors also have the ability to declare martial law. So you could have states that don't agree with what's happening in the federal government that declare martial law in order to protect their citizens and maintain control over their state. Uh, and you have other states that might decide not to because they're okay with what's happening. It could be chaos, it could be detrimental, and it could be on a federal level level the insurrection act explained this is something else that we need to be very aware of because this was a lot of the talk of the town just in recent times and this is something that is important based on how people will be looked at post any type of coup type scenario or martial law situation okay the insurrection act authorizes the president to deploy military forces inside the united states to suppress rebellion or domestic violence or to enforce the law in certain situations okay it basically tramples the Constitution immediately. But this is something that exists. The statute implements Congress's authority under the Constitution to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. It is a primary exception to the Posse Comitatus Act, under which federal military forces are generally barred from participating in civilian law enforcement activities, which is still true to a degree under martial law. However, once martial law is declared, the military then can create and remove laws as seen fit, not to mention the fact that the Insurrection Act could be authorized and simultaneously to a martial law type scenario. Although it's often referred to as the Insurrection Act of 1807, the law is actually an amalgamation of different statutes enacted by Congress between 1792 and 1871. Today, these provisions occupy sections 251 through 255 in Title 10 of the United States Code. What does invoking the Insurrection Act allow the president and the military to do? Under normal circumstances, the Posse Comitatus Act forbids U.S. military, including federal armed forces and National Guard troops who have been called into service from taking part in civilian law enforcement. This prohibition reflects an American tradition that views military interference in civilian government as being inherently dangerous to liberty. Which it is. Which is why this is a big deal. Invoking the Insurrection Act temporarily suspends the Posse Comitatus rule and allows the president to deploy the military to assist civilian authorities with law enforcement. That might involve soldiers doing anything from enforcing a federal court order to suppressing an uprising against the government. Of course, not every domestic use of the military involves law enforcement activity. Other laws, such as the Stafford Act, allow the military to be used to respond to natural disasters, public health crises, 
seas, however you want to say it, and <laughs> other similar events without waiving the restrictions of the Posse Comitatus Act. In theory, the Insurrection Act should only be used in a crisis that is truly beyond the capacity of civilian authorities to manage. However, the Insurrection Act fails to adequately define or limit when it may be used and instead gives the president significant power to decide when and where to deploy U.S. military forces domestically. So, take this back to our conversation about the Second Amendment firearms rights and crossing that line of firearms confiscation if there is a kinetic reaction due to those events and due to those actions from the federal government the insurrection act could easily be implemented in order to use the u.s military to quell said rebellion and because there's a rebellion occurring that gives all justifications needed for martial law to exist during that time so these things are pushing us in that direction i'm not saying for sure we're going to see martial law because of them but i am saying that they are all making that probability higher and higher which is something we should be aware of. Now, do you all know much about habeas corpus? Because this is something we should talk about. And real quick, uh, let's see. Nick, here's the thing I'm going to tell you, Nick. You do a lot of super chats, and I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to ask me these types of questions, I am super open and happy to share that information with you. Join the Discord first, because that's a free source where you can talk to other people here in this community that will allow you to ask these exact questions. You'll get a lot of good opinions and a lot of good suggestions based on people who are out there using that type of equipment or have used it in the past. Um, and I think it'll give you some really good ideas as to what it is you might actually be looking for. So make sure you join the Discord. I think that's a good idea first off. And second off, um, I would like you to, if you would like, I'm not saying you have to, but if you would like... Um, maybe check out the Subscribestar page because the Subscribestar page is five bucks a month, which is less money than you've already sent me on this chat tonight. Um, but then you can message me directly and we can have a full on conversation there and I'll give you all my advice and suggestions. No, no problem. Uh, the only issue is that sharing all that stuff here on a live stream can be distracting from the conversation as well as um, cause me problems on this platform, depending on how, let's just say how strongly of a suggestion i make if that makes any sense i'm not allowed to promote certain things let's just say so either one works for me but i would suggest using those resources if you're able to uh and i appreciate you nick i really do i just don't want you to think um uh that i'm uh trying to ignore your questions i'm trying to give you the best way of maintaining that conversation if you'd like to okay and i have no problem giving you my advice or suggestions when it comes to that stuff uh, but I just can't do it here right this second. So, um, well, habeas corpus is something you should be very aware of, okay? Habeas corpus is basically how to avoid indefinite imprisonment. If you're going to be imprisoned, you are due a trial. And you are not allowed to be held without reason uh, based on U.S. law. But it's been suspended before. And it could easily be suspended again, especially during some type of martial law, insurrection act, coup type scenario don't think for a second they wouldn't suspend it they most definitely would and i think what george bush did regarding the habeas uh corpus situation is something that would be applied to i don't know anybody who's part of said rebellion or whatever it might be okay so on October 17th, 2006, George W. Bush signed a law suspending the right of habeas corpus to persons determined by the United States to be an enemy combatant in the global war on terror. Bush's action drew severe criticism, mainly for the law's failure to specifically designate who in the United States will determine who is and who is not an enemy combatant. We don't need to read anything else about this for you to understand exactly how this could be used against you. Who determines who's an enemy combatant? I don't know. Probably the people in charge. What if the people in charge are the ones who created the enemy combatants by crossing too many lines? Well, habeas corpus doesn't need to exist. Lock them up and throw away the key. Who cares? No one's going to miss them, right? Keep that in mind. All these things are possible. And then let's talk about something happening right this second, which could give us some ideas as to how some of these, uh, uh, you know, we'll just say... Government affiliated leaders tend to act regarding martial law and elections because that's something we're talking about right now. Billy Bird, I don't actually have an OnlyFans. I just thought that that part of my uh, bury a gun video was uh, just the right place to <laughs> to mention that. So if you don't know, uh, watch that video and then you'll know. All right. So Ukraine is doing things or not doing things, I guess. They will hold elections after the war ends, says Zelensky. Okay, Elections in Ukraine will be held in 2024 only if martial law is ended by then, said Vladimir Zelensky. 
So let's can emphasize that according to the Ukrainian constitution, no elections could be held in the country while martial law remains in effect. So not saying that that's what could, what's going to happen here. That's not necessarily how martial law is interpreted here in the United States. But it just goes to show you that people who are in power will use things to their advantage to maintain that power if need be. And is that the right decision for them? I don't know. I'm not over there and I don't have a say. So they have to decide that for themselves because it is difficult to change leadership during a war. I understand that part of it. Um, but we have voted during wars many times here in this country, including the Civil War. So um, however you want to look at it, leadership might have to change depending on how the people feel about it. But I guess over there, you don't have to worry about that as long as you're still under martial law. <sighs> okay. <laughs> and so what could happen due to all of those things that we just discussed? Once again, martial law. If 2024 goes badly, election-wise, there's really no reason to believe that martial law couldn't exist and in the fact that it, that it would not exist. Um, if things go badly at the end of that election based on the results, I would expect to see something happen. I don't know what it is yet. I don't want to see anything happen. I am a prepper. The reason I'm a prepper is because I want to be ready for whatever could occur. In order to be ready for whatever could occur, I have to... At least, at the bare minimum, I have to entertain the possibilities that these things could happen, however unlikely they may be. Martial law has happened multiple times. It will happen again. No matter what, there will be martial law again in the United States at some point in time. We don't know when for sure. But the things we're discussing tonight are definitely capable of bringing us there. So that's why we need to be on top of these things, okay? So, just a quick reminder... Um, I do have the private live stream hangout tonight for channel members as well as subscribe star members, which I'm just doing at 10 o'clock tonight. Um, and this is just an incentive for those who are supporting the ch channel directly financially, right? I appreciate all of you for doing thumbs ups, for subscribing, for liking and all the stuff. Um, but the people who are literally supporting the channel financially and directly, um, I am doing these private hangouts for just so I can kind of give back and say, hey, and spend some time with those people. So if you want to be part of that, sign up for the subscribe star or join the YouTube channel memberships. Uh, and then you'll have access to that live stream tonight as well as every Monday from here on out, unless I decide to cancel because I hurt my leg walking the dog or something, you know? So things happen. Uh, South Florida DCL says we need to all be prepared for what is coming. And I agree with you on that. Uh, Rip Curl Readiness, thanks for being here and modding. Uh, I believe if we get into a World War III, many Americans will not back the war and will come together against the current administration. I I think that that belief has sensibility to it, but I, I would caution that uh, idea only because they will use the massive propaganda machine that they have access to to garner support for said conflict before entering anything, um, which is how they usually do things. So um, just keep that in mind. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do it, but I would be very, um, very, uh, uh, I guess, I would assume they'll do something. That's the best way I'm going to say that. Count Chad the Impaler says, imposition of a draft may trigger a rebellion. Possibly. Um, I think people would be more likely to dodge it than actually rebel openly um, against it. Uh, but yeah, there is there is that. So what else could bring us closer to martial law? Well, I think we all know the elephant in the room, which is something we still have to monitor and talk about, is a World War III scenario. And this could easily bring in martial law. Because entering a war with superpowers like China and Russia opens the door to some very dangerous possibilities and would in immediately create economic downturn. It would immediately create dangerous situations all over the country, not to mention the likelihood of a grid down type scenario. And in any grid down type scenario, martial law is likely going to be enacted because the federal and the local authorities will be overwhelmed immediately if that happens. They will not be able to handle it on their own, which means they will need the full support of the American military, which may be too busy to actually help because of things that are happening. China, Russia send warships near Alaska. U.S. responds with Navy destroyers. This is from today. Okay. 
11 military vessels from China and Russia found operating near the Aleutian Islands last week were met by four U.S. Navy destroyers, Alaska's two U.S. senators said. The two Republican senators, Dan Sullivan and Lisa Murkowski, issued a joint news release Saturday night saying they had been briefed about the operation. We have been in close contact with leadership from Alaska Command for several days now and received detailed classified briefings about the foreign vessels, Murkowski said. The incursion by 11 Chinese and Russian warships operating together off the coast of Alaska is yet another rem reminder that we have entered a new era of authoritarian aggression led by the dictators in Beijing and Moscow, Sullivan said. Yes, China and Russia are working together. Yes, they will continue to work together. And yes, if we enter World War III, we are likely dealing with both China and Russia. Keep that in mind, it's not a good place for us to be. It'll definitely lead to a martial law situation. Why? Because so many parts of our country are vulnerable to an attack solely because of the internet. Cyber attacks are on the rise, and both of these countries have the capacity of hurting us from within, not to mention sleeper cells, uh, military-aged males pouring in through the border, and anything that uh, any other infrastructure that has been set up prior to some type of open conflict scenario uh, will activate and then create a very dangerous situation. So keep those things in mind. China. Releases TV documentary showcasing Army's ability to attack Taiwan. August 6th, that's yesterday. This is getting bigger. This Everything in the world right now regarding war is escalating. These things are increasing. They are not de-escalating. They have not de-escalated at all since the beginning of the war. It's only getting worse. It will only be a matter of time until something catastrophic happens if things don't stop. So since they aren't de-escalating and they aren't stopping, we should expect something very bad happening. China has released a new documentary about the Army's preparation to attack Taiwan and showcasing soldiers pledging to give up their lives if needed as Beijing continues to ramp up its rhetoric against the self-ruled island. Chasing Dreams, an eight-part docuseries aired by state broadcaster CCTV earlier this week to mark the people... Liberation Army's 96th anniversary features military drills and testimonials by dozens of soldiers, of which several express their willingness to die in a potential attack against Taiwan. Hmm. How many Americans are willing to die to protect Taiwan? Raise your hand. Do we need Taiwan as an ally? I mean, I think it's a good idea. I think we need access to their microchips. I think that we need a partner in the Pacific that can help us establish a buffer zone between China and the U.S. Um, but I'm not willing to die for Taiwan. But China's troops apparently are saying they're willing to die to retake it. So the motivation and the energy required to do such a thing um, seems to be lying in on one side of the court at this point in time. Okay. China claims Taiwan, a self-ruled democracy, as its own territory, to be conquered by force if necessary. State media and the PLA frequently release propaganda materials promoting the Army's modernization, as well as sleek videos of military drills. The materials serve to fan rising Chinese nationalism and display military confidence against Taiwan and implicitly its ties with the United States. While the U.S. doesn't recognize Taiwan as a sovereign country, it has pledged to help the island defend itself in case of an invasion. Last month, the White House announced $345 million in mili or a 345 million dollar military aid package for Taiwan. The move, which experts said drew on lessons from the U.S. military assistance to Ukraine, was criticized by Beijing. Okay, ramping it up, ramping it up, ramping it up. Should we keep ramping it up? Do you think that if World War III is actually happening directly in the sense of United States fighting Russia and China, especially maybe even here at home, or at least in our vicinity in the oceans, right? Um, do you think that uh, martial law might be declared? I have a good feeling it will be. Oh, wait. Pentagon green lights first batch of Abrams tanks for Ukraine. Oh, should we, ra should we ramp it up? Should we ramp it up? The first batch of M1 Abrams main battle tanks, which the United States is transferring to the armed forces of Ukraine, has been approved for shipment, expected to arrive in Ukraine in early fall. U.S. Army Acquisition Chief Doug Bush announced on August 7th. He emphasized that not only the tanks will be transferred, but a complete package of equipment needed to support and maintain them. This is, I'm sure no one will care. I'm sure Russia won't care. I'm sure no one will care. Why would they? This is normal for us to just be supporting a proxy war, right? Uh, let's see. Count Chad the Impaler says China's opening move would be 330 million Americans with no power. I agree. They have the cyber capabilities to do that right this second. And guess what? They have backup plans. They have contingency plans. 
Guess what happens if they don't get the cyber attack to go through? Well, I guess the guys on the ground will just go shoot a couple of uh, Transformers. Since, you know, those are behind on production already and re take months to replace and can literally black out entire communities in one single rifle shot. So, yeah, um, yeah, they can easily black us out. Not to mention the fact that those balloons that flew over the country, I don't know, maybe they figured out which nine power stations to attack in order to take down the entire grid. Possibly, I don't know, but I'm just saying they got a lot of surveillance during that time, didn't they? So, uh, Rip Curl Readiness says, I know China won't stop at Taiwan because Japan will step in to defend Taiwan and China will then take Japan if they can. That might be the case. And of course we are an ally with Japan and that would create even bigger situations. Are we giving tanks to Ukraine? Yeah. Have we already done that kind of stuff? Sure. Are we giving our first Abrams tanks to Ukraine? Yeah. Are we going to just keep doing that into infinity? Uh, I don't know. But other countries seem to be doing the same thing because they're concerned about where we're headed. I mean, we're not going in a good direction here, according to some of these other countries. And I agree with them in many ways. Belarus begins military drills near its border with Poland as Lithuania uh, and Lithuania as tensions heighten. Okay. This is from today. Belarus began military exercises Monday near its border with Poland and Lithuania. A move coming with tensions already heightened with the two NATO members over Russia-linked Wagner mercenaries moving to Belarus after their short-lived mutiny in Russia. Both Poland and Lithuania have increased border security. Since thousands of Wagner fighters arrived in Russian-allied Belarus under a deal that ended their armed rebellion in late June and allowed them and their leader, Yegevny Prigozhin, to avoid criminal charges. Leaders of the two NATO nations have said they are braced for provocations from Moscow and Minsk. Minsk. In a sensitive area where both countries border Belarus, as well as the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad. They commented early in August after two Belarusian helicopters flew briefly at low altitude into Polish airspace. Belarusian authorities denied their helicopters entered Poland. Okay, this is escalating. If something happens over on that border, NATO gets involved immediately. That's what happens, or that's what I've been told. Guess we'll find out. Are there any other places around the world where we would like to escalate things? Ah, uh, yeah, why not? Thousands of U.S. troops arrive in Red Sea amid ratcheting Iran tensions. More than 3,000 U.S. sailors and Marines aboard two warships have reached the Red Sea, U.S. Navy says. More than 3,000 U.S. military personnel have arrived in the Red Sea on board two warships, part of a beefed-up response from the United States after alleged seizures of several civilian ships by Iran. The U.S. sailors and Marines entered the Red Sea on Sunday after transiting through the Suez Canal in a pre-announced deployment, the U.S. 5th Fleet said in a statement on Monday. The deployment adds to a growing U.S. military buildup in tense Gulf waterways vital to the global oil trade and led Tehran on Monday to accuse Washington of inflaming regional instability. The U.S. military says Iran has either seized or attempted to take control of nearly 20 internationally flagged ships in the region over the past two years. And there is uh, plans in the works for, um, at least in my uh, understanding, to to deploy troops on some of these civilian ships in order to protect them from this situation. If there are military troops on a civilian ship that gets seized by Iran and something happens to those troops from the Iranian military, how does that how is that viewed? What happens then? I don't know. But I don't like it. I don't think it's the right move necessarily. Pilgrim Prepper says Poland is next. Definitely possible. Joel um, Achner, 500 plus major transformers in America, 20, 247 came from from china our engineers took a few apart and reverse engineered them they have mystery components they think they're shutoff switches dandy possibly we all know that that's a, a concern and has been a concern for quite some time especially in the preparedness community thanks to the fact that they've even found radio transmitters in chinese made electronics so keep that all in mind maybe uh you know I, I i'm not the guy who usually is like oh what about your red dot site it's gonna go down but maybe by an aim point or eotech is a decent idea so you don't have to worry about anything that's assembled or made in china i'm just throwing it out there all right so let's see here people want us to go to war what do they know that if we go to war there'll be martial law oh well i guess they don't care u.s troops should be sent to ukraine third of americans say a third really okay says newsweek and this is from august 2nd Almost a third of Americans support U.S. troops being sent to war torn Ukraine, according to a new poll. A total of 31% of eligible voters in the U.S. support or strongly support American military forces heading to the battlefields of Ukraine. Polling conducted exclusively for Newsweek by Redfield and Wilton Strategies has revealed. 
A quarter of respondents neither supported nor opposed the idea of sending U.S. soldiers to Ukraine, with 34% against the suggestion. Just under 1 in 10 respondents did not know. So understand that the real number you need to be concerned about here is 34% against the suggestion. So like you were saying before, Rip Curl, um, I don't think people like us would be okay with going to World War III or under these conditions. But apparently, at least according to this poll, only 34% of people think the way we do. Which means the majority are either in support of it or don't care. And the people who don't care might as well be voting to be in support of it. So, this is something to keep in mind. The, the, the machine is working. When I say the machine, I mean the information that's put out there that's trying to persuade people to believe that this is something that we should be involved in is working. And... A third of the country wanting to go over there and, and do these things should tell you a lot. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea, but this will lead us down the wrong path in many ways. Now, uh, let's see here. Christopher Reed, how many people were polled? You know what? I missed that number, and give me one second here, because I think I can pull it back up real quick. No, no, no. Trying to find it quickly for you, and maybe I can't as easily as I would like to. Uh, da, da, da. It was 1,500 people, so not many people. But it still gives you an idea as to out of 1,500 people, 500 people said they were fine with it. Okay, now, it gave me some more demographics and stuff like that, but I didn't want to spend more time on that per se. I did want to move on to the historical precedent. So don't forget that in World War II, martial law occurred in Hawaii. Okay, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, martial law was declared. It would not take very much for martial law to be declared in a World War III scenario. And especially with cyber attacks and infrastructure attacks being almost guaranteed in that type of a situation, there would not be... Okay, I guess... Think of it this way. Our current systems, the police, uh, a lot of our government agencies rely on technology to be able to continue to operate in many, many ways. They rely on technology for a lot of their daily functions. That technology goes away. They will immediately be overwhelmed by trying to maintain law and order during a crisis scenario like a grid down. That then leads to them needing that extra assistance, which means martial law is declared. Even if they don't receive said assistance, the rules now allow for laws to be manipulated, changed, or even cease to exist. And because of that, people will be subjugated to whatever it is that the local authority body decides to subjugate them to. Now, will the people come together and say, no, that's enough? Highly possible. But what people are doing that? Not every group of people who is well-armed and well-trained is also good at leadership or also good at fairness, right? So just because a group has well-armed and well-trained and decides to say no to the local authority uh, trying to implement martial law doesn't mean they're the, your friends either. They might be worse than the local authority in many ways. And in some places where you have heavy presences of cartels and gangs and everything else, they'll overrun the local police very quickly and then you'll have to deal with them as opposed to whoever else would have been in charge otherwise. So keep all these things in mind. Now, this is something important to keep in mind as well. Historical precedent matters because we can learn from it. The bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 ushered the United States into World War II. Within hours, and suspension and martial law came to rule the Hawaiian territory. On the mainland, the military imposed curfews, designated huge portions of the western United States to be military areas of exclusion, and ultimately created relocation centers across the west to detain over 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, including over 70,000 citizens. As this chapter explores in the face of serious constitutional questions about the propri uh, propriety of martial law, internment of citizens, and military trials of civilians, constitutional considerations generally gave way to hysteria. That's what you should expect. These relocation centers, they could easily be set up for people who are problematic. You know who's problematic? People who don't necessarily always do what they're told. People who don't always line up to do whatever the government asks for them to do. Those people are problematic. And you know what makes it a lot easier to deal with those people and possibly send them to their relocation centers? Well, you know, martial law. So... 
in a wartime scenario, in a contested election scenario, and in a crossing the line scenario regarding Second Amendment rights, all three of those easily push us towards martial law. And right now, at least from my understanding and like my research, I guess you would say, uh, those are the three things I foresee right the second, getting us closer to that inevitability. And like that was uh, talked about in that article regarding the general who was concerned about a military coup in the 2024 elections, he called it an inevitability. He did not call it a possibility, which should concern you because it kind of tells you where our country is at this point. So these are valid concerns and things to prepare for. And we should be prepared for them. We just should. Um, even Hoover, FBI head, was against JM interning. Yeah, because that was constitutionally wrong. Um, it shouldn't have happened, and it should not happen. But hysteria will lead people to allow for rights to be relinquished. And in a contested election scenario, where a certain portion of the population is demonized as being the reason for why the country is having to deal with a martial law, military coup type scenario, who do you think would be the proverbial Japanese population at that point in time? You can, you can simmer on that if you'd like, but I think the answer is pretty obvious. So... Uh, listen, I just want everyone to be aware of these things. I'm not saying that this will happen 100%. I will say that there's a likelihood of it occurring if things keep escalating in all of those categories. And the Second Amendment one's an interesting one because there is a line that will eventually be crossed. Do people react in the way that they talk about on the internet? No. The internet's an easier place to discuss those things because there's no repercussions for inaction right just typing words doesn't really have any consequence but are there things that will push people to do more than just type words yeah can that happen yes are there possible issues with our upcoming 2024 election cycle that i don't think uh the country will be able to agree on yeah in many ways um I don't think it really matters who wins, per se. Uh, the, the entire population has lost faith in the system, which means that uh, there's going to be issues. And do I think that by ramping up every escalatory situation around the world on almost a daily basis, we'll eventually find ourselves in an actual hot World War III type scenario? Yeah. We're going to place soldiers on ships in... Iranian territory, that's going to create an issue. We're going to constantly be dealing with Russia and China incur, incur, uh, <clears throat> incurring on our you know, our borders. Yeah, that's an issue. Uh, are we going to have to deal with Taiwan at some point in time? Yeah, that's an issue. So these things are just um, problematic and they're, and they're leading us in that direction. And that's, that's a concern for me. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let me know your thoughts in general. Hopefully this gave you all some things to think about. I think these three things are pushing us towards martial law, and I also think that all three of them can occur simultaneously. Because you know what would be really easy to foresee? World War III. Suddenly you have leadership in the White House that doesn't want to go anywhere, uh, which creates a coup of some sort because the military is being forced to fight wars that they weren't necessarily wanting to have to fight, but they were pushed into it. And that coup leads to the martial law declaration, which means that a certain portion of the population needs to be disarmed in order to maintain safety and stability throughout the country, which means that those people are going to react in a way that people don't want to see them react in. Uh, and then all three of them happen simultaneously, amazingly, all at the same time. Almost like it's magic. <laughs> Had to. I think that's going to be it for tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If you're here on the replay, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Uh, make sure you do all the YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe. Listen, I will tell you guys this 100%. Anytime we have these conversations, the reach is, is limited in many ways, especially after the live stream. So I would really appreciate any help I can get when it comes to sharing some of this message. Because the live streams, I try really hard to maintain them for current events as well as possibilities that we need to prepare for. Um, and I'm hoping to kind of structure these in more of a targeted manner instead of just kind of having that broad stroke 
woke up. All right, it's been a week. What happened last week? All over the entire world, all over the entire planet regarding who knows what. Uh, hopefully, maybe some of these more topic-related discussions will have more value to all of you just because um, uh, they're a little bit more concise and to the point. So um, thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Prepare like it's 1776. You got it. And I appreciate you as well. Uh, Eric uh, Pagazowski, thank you for being here. And I will see you all next time. That's going to be it for Magic Prepper.